Welcome back to EM Prime. Now, there are many workers during the pandemic who have been risking their lives to provide essential services to the citizens of our country. Unfortunately, the services of many in the working class have not been given the same support and social protection as other essential services have. With us this morning to shed light on some of the challenges faced by the working class of our country is Ian Daniel, the head of the Labour Studies Department at the Cipriani College of Labour and Cooperative Studies. Ian holds a Master of Science in Sociology and is also involved in the design and facilitation of specialized and customized training interventions in industrial relations practice. Uh, welcome to the show, Ian. Good morning. Thank you. Thanks. So jumping straight into it, um, I, I would love for us to define what exactly is the working class? Well, that depends on how you want to look at it. For me, the working class, it come, the idea of the working class comes out of essentially radical class analysis, which would therefore create a demarcation between those who own business, those who own capital, and those who provide their labor um, for uh, usually the, the remuneration um, in, in a salary or some kind of payment structure. Um, but a more contemporary definition could include basically um, anybody who is working, uh, who could conceivably therefore be small entrepreneurs, could be people working in the informal sector, it could be people who combine um, different kinds of, of um, income, um, but you, you end up um, with a distinction largely between well, wealthy and um, people who work well. <laughs> Gotcha. And in terms of the working class and their contributions to society, um, because when we think about um, how our economy is, is, is built, we normally think about, well, just money coming from the oil and gas sector, um, but we do have other mm -hmm. revenue streams. So how does the working class uh, relate to our economy and, and its movement? Uh, quite frankly, unless you're focusing on um, what are the most important areas of the economy in terms of contribution to GDP and GNP and, you know, all that kind of stuff. I'm not an economist, so I don't focus mm -hmm. on those things. Um, the, the, the working class is the economy. The working class are the people who create and provide um, everything else that keeps the economy going. The working class are the people who are involved in transportation, who are involved in agriculture, uh, who are involved in, in, in services. They are the ones who fill out organizations, they can fill out businesses. Um, they're the ones who earn income and then spend that income, which then creates the revenue that goes into business. So basically, without the working class, you have no economy. Thank you. And in terms of uh, normally when we look at and you see it in other jurisdictions, when they refer to be it um, the working class or, or um, middle class, uh, lower middle class, all of these terms that we hear. Um, but when we look at the working class, if we have to come up with a profile of someone who may be in the working class, because we may look at it um, through their um, socioeconomic standing and, and so forth, um, what kind of a profile would we probably derive from? From looking at uh, the working class. <laughs> All right, so, so what you're asking me to do there is to go into one of the, the more difficult aspects of, <laughs> of class analysis, and that is consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, that kind of distinction is about how do you see yourself? Do, do you see yourself as um, wealthy and therefore different from everybody else? Do you see yourself as poor and therefore different from everybody else? If I'm if I'm quote unquote middle class, do I see myself as more um, related to the, the owners of business or do I self, see myself related to the people who, who um, work? And, and you will find that that consciousness is, is different throughout the society. Um, there's the, the expectation that the people who will define themselves as working class seem to 
consider themselves to be at the bottom of society and may have some overlap with the idea of being poor. Um, but I, I can assure you that does not um, apply to the majority of people who will consider themselves to be workers or in the working class. Gotcha. And well, Ian, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we are going to take a deeper dive into um, the working class and especially how COVID-19 has impacted on uh, the working class. So we'll be right back. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for staying with us. We are speaking with Ian Daniel, who is the head uh, of labor study of the Labor Studies Department at the Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies, and we are discussing the working class. Now, Ian, um, I want to find out what are some of the threats that the working class is uh, currently facing here in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, well, you can. As, um, what are the challenges that, they're being, that are being faced as a consequence of, of the pandemic? But the list that you will get from asking that question will be the list of the old challenges that, that the working class has faced um, historically in our society since the 1930s, the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, and 90s. Mm -hmm. What are we talking about? We're talking about the access to safe employment. We're talking about accent, uh, access to decent work, um, employment that, that gives you the opportunity to live, to live satisfactorily, to protect yourself and your family. We're looking at currently loss of income as a, as a result of the contraction of the economy due to the, the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking at rising prices at the same time as so many people have experienced drastic losses in income. I mean, I know people in my own family who've been home for the last three months without income um, and, and who are facing another three months home, you know, in, in, in many instances without income. Um, and, and, you know, the question is, as prices go up, how do these people live, you know? Um, and the strange thing about it is that we blame these people for being, um, for, for lacking foresight, for not having saved, for, for um, being greedy when they get into lines for, for, for uh, assistance. Yes. Um, but businesses that, that close down and, and release people in a month's time, you know, aren't, aren't criticized in, in the same way. Um, you throw people to work remotely, you have the problem of access to technology, and as you can see with me, um, access to bandwidth, you know, um, you have the intensification of work, people working remotely tell you that they're working 16 hours a day, because yeah. people call them at, at, at all hours of the day or night, um, and transfer of the cost of work, electricity bills, um, Wi-Fi bills, these things come to you when you have to work remotely. Um, access to representation, but very importantly, access to social protection. Mm -hmm. um, what the, the, what the, 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 the pandemic has demonstrated is, is all of the weaknesses in our society. If a natural disaster occurs, how do people survive? And you see that we are, we are, as a society, not really prepared to deal with the fallout of large-scale disruptions of the economy and the society. And the, and the last point I want to say in this, um, in terms of challenges, is mental health. Yes. Um, because when you get locked down like this, when you get locked out of the of the normal cultural practices of the society when you get locked out of your normal for this long, nearly two years. It's going to affect you, it's going to affect children. We have not taken mental health seriously as a society. We're going to have to do that now. Now, in, in terms of uh, social protections, because I want to touch back mm -hmm. on that, um, I know that um, a few days ago, uh, the 
college, there was an article, and in it, one of the things that I, I was able to take away was that uh, Cipriani lobbies for a rights-based and participatory approach to social protection mm -hmm. as a human right, mm -hmm. as opposed to a variable network of grants and temporary acts of charity. Um, what exactly is this rights-based and participatory approach to social protection? <laughs> I, uh, Atkins and I had a lot of discussion about that part of the article, yes. Mm -hmm. um, Listen, the, the, the grants are inevitable because things will come up that you didn't anticipate as a society and you're going to have people in need, you're going to have to do these things. Yeah. But so much of what comes up as a society can in fact be predicted. They, they, they can in fact be anticipated and you can plan for them. Um, I don't think that the Caribbean as a whole and many societies in the world have done a very good job of creating these plans to deal with these kinds of issues that affect a minority under most circumstances, but then in these kind of circumstances can suddenly affect a whole lot of people. Yes. Um, grants also have the problem of being perceived as charity. And I have a real problem with people thinking that they're doing me charity after I've paid my taxes, you know, for all my life and I've contributed to my society. Because inevitably, at some point in time, the people who think that the charity is coming from them experience donor fatigue. Hmm. Um, and then they start to blame the victims. You should have done this. You should have done that. It's time for you to stand up on your own as you see happening in the united states of america right now yes. so we're not unique in, in these instances at all i believe in universal rights i believe in the rights of citizens now that's not easy because to have universal rights you have to pay for universal rights which means that we have to contribute um, to funds to insurance schemes insurance um, programs that will provide the kind of relief and assistance that is necessary um, for all manner of, of things, for including um, unemployment and then down the road, um, pension and, and retirement. Um, but these will always have the issues of um, contribution, who has the ability to pay, and would be based on, I think, um, progressive tax systems and an enforced tax system where the people who can pay and should be paying do pay, which one can argue is something that really does not occur here a whole lot. Yes. Now, I, I understand as well from the article um, that the college has expressed that women and participants in the informal sector are two groups uh, that are disproportionately experiencing the negative effect of this natural healthcare disaster. Um, but in respect of the informal sector, um, what exactly is the informal sector? Okay, well, there, there are various definitions for the informal sector, but basically, once you're off the books, mm -hmm. <laughs> once you're not recognized by the state, once you're not, you're not registered, you're not paying um, taxes to the state, um, then you have a degree of informality. Um, and so, therefore, the informal sector can include um, the, the criminal activity, but a lot mm -hmm. of legal activity um, is done in the informal sector as well. And then if you, if you think of an economy of, of an exchange of goods and services, then you will understand that the, the informal sector um, is not just a group of people who provide, but it's a group of, a group of people who purchase services as well. So, mm -hmm. so I may be um, a, a participant in the informal sector if I buy services from, say, an informal yard man mm -hmm. um, who just comes about with his whacker and, 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 and cuts grass. You might be uh, a participant if you buy from the guy who, um, fish from the guy who's driving a truck or, you know, um, scrap iron buying, scrap iron yes. buying. All of that is part of the informal sector. But, or a mm -hmm. professional who provide services for cash without a bill, which means that those services, though the, 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 the payment does not get recorded for taxation purposes, yes. that professional is in the informal sector as well. 
Now, I, I, based on my observation or the information that I have available to me, um, it appears as though not sufficient enough work has been done by the state, the government, no matter whomsoever is in office, uh, to bring more persons into the uh, formal sector. Of course, we saw recently in Parliament the mm -hmm. legislation on the gaming, um, the gambling, mm -hmm. gaming and betting control bill coming on there and it was met with some resistance. But outside of that, we have been talking for years about the possibility of bringing um, entrepreneurs under our tax mm -hmm. system, um, so sole traders and so forth, um, down to the mm -hmm. doubles vendor. Why do you think we have not made those kinds of strides to bring those individuals into the formal sector? Well, uh, I like the fact that you use the term entrepreneur because that's what they are. That it is entrepreneurial activity to go out there and make your own business um, because the formal sector does not provide enough employment for everyone or enough opportunity for everyone. Now, um, one of the reasons that, that you get into the informal sector in this way is because it's easy. Um, there, there, there are no regulations that, um, that will, will bring cost to you. Um, you don't have to go and pay a, a, a fee to register. You, you mm -hmm. don't have to um, go and, and get licenses and, and, and all that kind of thing. Um, you, you don't have to pay other kinds of business-related charges. And what that means is that you are able then to... to give the, the lesser cost onto the market. And that's why I'm saying that we who purchase from them are an important part of the informal sector. Because if I had to, to get my yard clean mm -hmm. by an official um, landscaping company, then the price would be a whole lot different yes. than if I were getting it from the one guy walking around with, with, his, his, with his whacker. Mm -hmm. And imagine if you had to buy doubles from a shop all the time, but from a cart, what the actual price of a doubles would be. Yeah. So, so yes, there, there are barriers to bringing um, the, 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 form, the informal into the formal um, in terms of ease of entry and cost of the product. Mm -hmm. um, but you are right. It is something that we have to spend time and give some imagination um, to, to, towards achieving because yeah. all of the, the things like social protection would depend on, you know, that transfer into formality as well. Yeah. Now, we have unfortunately run out of time, but in the last couple of seconds, I want to squeeze out of you here. And I know this is a huge topic and it could take up an entire show, um, <laughs> but I want to get uh, your response to this. I know in the United States, for instance, there is an ongoing debate about um, unions. So you see on the Democrat side, um, they are pro-union and on the conservatives, they are against um, unions to some degree. In Trinidad and Tobago, we have a rich history when it comes to our unions, but have our unions based on your observation, because we are talking about working class um, citizens and some of the protections or the representation that they may have, have our unions in Trinidad and Tobago uh, gotten with the times, so to say? Have we seen adaptations uh, to how they do business and, and well, how they represent? Um, or are we seeing a model for representation from our unions in 2021 that can be almost reminiscent of, of our past ways of doing things? I know it's a huge question there, um, but... <laughs> <laughs> and at the risk of losing my job, I will try to answer the question. But the answer is yes and no. There are uh -huh. people who are doing better. There are people who haven't made the transition. Um, the, the old style trade unionism still exists, but there are people who are recognizing that their, their adaptations have to be made and are pushing um, new kinds of ideas, mm -hmm. uh, are reaching out to people who have traditionally been unrepresented are uh, focusing on the trade union as, as, as um, or almost a cooperative, looking at mm -hmm. the way uh, 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 that a trade union can help to generate wealth for workers um, to pool their resources. But what you're asking is also a bit of an unfair question mm -hmm. because nobody asks that of businesses. Workers are involved in businesses as well. Yes. Are businesses businesses for the 21st century or are they trapped in the 19th century? Do they see workers as some kind of cog in the wheel? Do they even see workers as uh, almost uh, uh, an inconvenience? 
and not as a source of your wealth, a source of your, your productivity. Yeah. When you have um, billion dollar profit industries who are paying minimum wage, you know, that's dark ages business. Mm -hmm. So, so um, yes, you can ask that, that question of, of trade unions and one should ask the question of trade unions. But one should also ask the question of um, businesses and one should ask the question of the state as well. Yes. Well, I, I know we could have delved into it a, a lot deeper, um, but I appreciate your, your, your answer there and you're very right. Um, let me say thank you for joining me this morning um, and for the nuggets of information that you've shared with us, putting into perspective the working class, some of the challenges being faced um, by the working class uh, and also speaking to um, some of the forms of representation and so forth. So Ian, thank you so much. You're very welcome. <laughs> that was Ian Daniel, the head of labor study of the Labor Studies Department at the Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies. We now take a quick look at Watch This. Trinidad and Tobago is blessed with a diverse culture of people and wildlife, especially regarding the birds that call this land their home. And we have some pictures here because Trinidad and Tobago has been known as the land of the hummingbird. And there are 18 species of the bird in our country. Now, these photos here uh, of hummingbirds were shared on the Facebook page, proud to be Trinbagonian. And no doubt, we should be proud of the biodiversity that is found within our borders. So there you see some beautiful images of hummingbirds here in Trinidad and Tobago. We're going to take a quick break guys and when we come back more for you here on AM Prime.